many clinicians hear the word narcolepsy, they immediately assume, well, that's the sleepiest person there could be, that they fall asleep while talking to someone. And that's typically not the case, and we'll talk quite a bit about that tonight. But certainly, narcolepsy's hallmark is uh, daytime sleepiness, and usually is also the first symptom to occur. As we've talked about, and Carl's going to spend a lot more time, there are five symptoms. It's a cataplexy, hypnagogic hallucinations, um, sleep paralysis, and disturbed sleep. Excessive sleepiness is usually the first manifestation to occur, and those others may not occur for several years or longer. <clears throat> In addition, many patients with narcolepsy, particularly as they get older, may have other sleep disorders, or sleep, and we'll talk about potential for obstructive apnea, restless leg syndrome, but they also may have medical illnesses, psychiatric illnesses, or medications that can sometimes cloud getting the diagnosis. So I think it's important to remember that when patients, they may have very severe excessive sleepiness, that they may not even say, I'm sleepy. In fact, I'm still waiting for the first patient to walk in my office and say, doctor, I'm excessively sleepy. Never heard that. They say, I'm tired. I don't have any energy. Or I can't do what I used to do. But many times the word tired or fatigue is used and that leads us down a different pathway. So it's important to remember that initial presentation, you may not get a history of cataplexy and it may take multiple times questioning the patient. And certainly for a patient, regardless of your initial impression and diagnosis, if they have ongoing symptoms, screening for that, as we'll talk about with the upper sleepiness scale and further questioning is imperative. The diagnosis of narcolepsy can then be established starting with the history, but then utilizing an overnight sleep study and following it with a daytime nap test called the multiple sleep latency test. Carl will talk more about this as well, but diagnostic challenges. Depression is very common. Depression can be associated with fatigue and sleepiness, and many times these overlap. Many narcoleptics present with depressive symptoms or with a history of depression. In addition, there's overlap with other disorders such as attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. These individuals, particularly in children, can have very disturbed sleep, but instead of being sleepy during the day, they may actually be hyperactive. So some overlap there, and in addition, narcolepsy can be associated with greater weight gain than someone that of the same age who doesn't have narcolepsy can also be um, confused with uh, some eating disorders as well. We look, when we talk about sleep disorders, and certainly the most common sleep disorder that is screened for, diagnosed, and treated in this country is obstructive sleep apnea. And it is extremely common, but nonetheless, there are a number of people who have not only obstructive apnea, but could have narcolepsy as well. And as narcolepsy patients get older, the incidence of them developing obstructive apnea is much higher than even the general population. So they can coexist. In addition, restless leg syndrome occurring in 5 to 10 percent of the population is extremely common to have as a comorbidity, as is periodic limb movements of sleep. And then REM behavior disorder, REM sleep behavior disorder, is a condition where Patients don't have the atonia of their musculoskeletal system that Tom mentioned during REM sleep. Typically, the only muscles that function during REM sleep are our eye muscles, hence the term rapid eye movement, and our breathing muscles, so we can continue to have ventilation throughout the night. But in REM behavior disorder, there is disinhibition of the skeletal muscle system, and patients can literally act out their dreams typically don't see that until after the age of 50 or even 60, but in narcolepsy, we can see it in much younger individuals. I've seen it in a child of eight years old before, but you can do it any age in narcolepsy. This slide just gives you an overview of the potential differential diagnosis when we look at the five symptoms, or CHESS. And I'm not going to go through each one of these, but as you can see, whether we're talking about cataplexy, excessive sleepiness or sleep disruption, there are other potential causes. And certainly we'll talk about some of these, but as Carl will discuss in much more detail, many times the differentiation isn't as difficult uh, as we think it might be. So given the potential for comorbidities in patients with narcolepsy, as well as the overlapping nature of symptoms among various sleep disorders, psychiatric disorders, and medical conditions, it can often be difficult for us as physicians and healthcare uh, professionals to correctly identify symptoms suggestive of narcolepsy. The information in the next section 
uh, is intended to help you improve your ability to see through the symptoms and comorbidities to help identify narcolepsy. Now let's hear some actual patient perspectives on their journey to diagnosis. I am not a real person to go to the doctor a lot, but probably I went to at least 10 doctors and described, Jerry and I both described my symptoms and they just didn't listen. I remember being in my early 20s and going to the doctor as a newlywed and saying, I'm just exhausted all the time, what's wrong? And the doctor said, you're depressed. So he gave me an antidepressant and, and told me to get more rest and make my husband do more things around the house. And, and it never really stopped. So I guess I had compensated for it my whole life. I've been sleepy since before I was 16 and uh, I, you know, made adjustments to my life because I could and I could take naps. You know, Tom, when we look at those, I think we see some fascinating things, but uh, as you heard those discussions, tell me what you thought. Well, you know, I, I think there were in many ways very typical stories, very consistent with what you said, the time to diagnosis, this 10-year delay. And, and you know, when I see that, those people, I sort of think of why the three of us are here today. Why is this program being developed? And, and, and very simply, the aim of this program, of this session, is to decrease that journey. So this incredibly long journey to get diagnosis. If we run this program again, that journey will be significantly shorter. I agree, I, I agree Jonathan. You know, when you think about it, those 10 years or 10 to 15 years where there's this delay in diagnosis are occurring at a time when these patients are young. These are the very, this is the very time that they need all of those very basic building blocks, emotional building blocks, cognitive and knowledge building blocks, and they're really losing out on a very, very important time in their lives. So this is why education, not only to doctors, but also to patients, is very important in this area. Absolutely.